right, good morning, everyone. Commissioner, uh, Consul General, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm John Tuttle, I'm Vice Chairman of the New York Stock Exchange and President of the NYC Institute. And on behalf of our entire team, a very, very warm welcome to the NYSC. We are particularly proud to welcome Commissioner McGinnis here today, and of course to partner with the European American Chamber of Commerce on today's program as well. So it's wonderful to see you all here at the exchange. We love hosting events like this and programs like this where we can bring together leaders from the public and private sectors to share ideas, build relationships, but ultimately create opportunities as well. And as we look at today's agenda, it's timely, it's topical, it hits on a lot of the issues that investors, that businesses, and that regulators are thinking about here in the United States, in Europe, and around the world. We're paying particular focus because you know, we, like many of you, understand the important role that the capital markets and more broadly the financial system and financial sector in general plays in driving inclusive economic growth in the United States and in Europe. And the ability for companies to access capital that they can use to grow and expand their businesses, to launch new products, to tap into new geographies, and along the way, create jobs and improve quality of life across this country, across Europe, and, and again, ultimately around the world. But a key pillar and a key part, I guess I should say part of that foundation uh, that allows that to happen is confidence. And confidence comes from having well-governed companies and properly regulated markets. And so it's a particular pleasure, again, to have the commissioner here today uh, to share her views on the financial markets on a whole host of topics as well. And so without any further ado, I'll turn it over to our great friends from the European American Chamber of Commerce to kick off today's program. Yvonne? Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, John, for uh, um, collaborating with us on, the, on today's program. And thank you to all of you for, for joining us. Um, the EACC, as many of you know, is a platform that brings together Europeans and Americans to do business. And like John just said, um, essential to that is um, market stability. And um, the, uh, um, we're absolutely thrilled that the commissioner could join us um, today on her way to Washington and talk to us about um, what Europeans need to know to do business in the US, what um, your American um, companies and um, financial institutions need to know to do business in Europe. And um, I would like to hand it over, um, the microphone, to Helena uh, Nolan. She's the Consul General of um, Ireland, and she will introduce the Commissioner and give us a little bit of background. Thank you. Thanks, Yvonne. Commissioner, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Helena Nolan, Consul General of Ireland here in New York. We're thrilled to have the Commissioner here with us today. We've been delighted to partner with Yvonne and her team at the European American Chamber of Commerce for this event. We love partnering with, with Yvonne and uh, we look forward to continued strong partnership with you. Um, it's my particular honor to introduce our special guest this morning. She has a very extensive CV and the sooner we get to hear from her directly, the better, but I'll just give a very quick overview of some of the highlights of her career. As you know, Mareg McGuinness is currently the European Commissioner for Financial Services, Financial Stability and Capital Markets Union. Her vision for the portfolio uh, is focused on ensuring the financial sector's strength and stability so that it can deliver for people, society and the environment. Before joining the Commission, uh, Ms. McGuinness was first Vice President of the European Parliament from 2017 and she served as an MEP from Ireland for 16 years. As Vice President, she oversaw relations with national parliaments, led the parliament's dialogue with religious and philosophical organizations, and had responsibility for the parliament's communication policy. Of course, she's a wonderful communicator herself, and was an award-winning journalist, broadcaster, and commentator before her career in politics. Uh, but during her time in the parliament, Ms. McGuinness sat on a range of committees covering agriculture, environment, public health, budget, uh, petitions and constitutional affairs, and her legislative work included leading for the EPP group on European climate law, the revision of medical devices legislation, and cap reform post-2013. Uh, in particular for us, as an Irish MEP, her voice was a strong and important one in Europe on the need to raise awareness and to address the consequences of Brexit for the island of Ireland, for which we continue to thank her and appreciate her. 
And so uh, I'm very proud to warmly welcome Commissioner Mairead McGuinness and invite you to uh, take, your, take your seat and join us this morning. Thank you. Can I just say when they start about my CV, I'm wondering what bit should they leave out? But thank you for that. It was was longer than I would have liked, because I'm older than I would have liked to be, so that's why there's a lot in the CV. <laughs> thank you. Well, uh, well, thank you for giving me this opportunity to interview you. I'm Lauren Silva Laughlin. I'm the US editor at Reuters Breaking Views, which is the commentary group within Reuters. Um, and uh, it's really wonderful to meet you. What a time to be live, huh? What's going on? Um, so we've come off the pandemic unprecedented capital flow into the system and inflation spiked, which has subsequently caused an interest rate spike, which now we've had completely stopped up capital markets. Um, no IPOs, mm -hmm. really uh, banks here in the US sitting on tons of loans that need to be syndicated before things start up again. In your crystal ball, what do you see happening in the next sort of three months, one year, five years? OK, well, let's start with where we've come from, because I think the full impact of the pandemic hasn't been factored into uh, the current scenario. If you look at January before this awful war that I'm sure we'll talk about happened, we were beginning to see problems with supply chains. If I look at commodity prices, there was beginning to be uh, increases. And then in February, we, we had the war. So I know when we were in the College of Commissioners, we were looking at a good 2022. This was the expectation in January. Growth was strong, um, you know, everything looked like fitting into place. In fact, I think that we had anticipated that COVID would have had a much more negative impact, but our banks were resilient going into the crisis and helped during it. So we came out with a, a strong story. I think everything changed on February the 24th. And I think that John mentioned the word confidence, and I think confidence is key. We know that there probably had to be some readjustments because of COVID and the war. Um, so if you ask me to predict, I actually left my crystal ball at home because it's not working anymore. <laughs> and I say that with, with as much concern as reality because nobody knows what's going to happen next. And that's the problem. That's why markets are, are not moving. That's why people are holding back investing because they want a little bit more certainty. So let me just, as I see it, um, I think we need to repeat that we came out of the pandemic stronger. From a European point of view, we also came out of the pandemic learning lessons like it's important to act quickly and together. And I think we did that when Russia illegally invaded Ukraine. So we learned lessons from that, which I think have strengthened us as a European Union. We borrowed collectively for the very first time. I think we've almost forgotten about that major change in policy. And the whole idea of that is to allow investments happen in member states to boost the economy. So it's good that we have that bedrock in place. Uh, for the next few months, I think we're all wondering what sort of winter we're going to have. Energy is the big talking point. Energy, is, energy prices feed into all commodity prices, feed into food price inflation. We, we know what the background story is. But we've made a commitment because it's the right thing to do to support Ukraine. We now realize we're over-reliant on Russian fossil fuel. We have to wean ourselves off fossil fuel anyway but Russian fossil fuel in particular. So some figures, the gas, um, Russia supplied 40% of our needs up until we've now adjusted. It's less than 10% or 9% today. Big move. But that required us to go elsewhere, look for other sources of supply, LNG, including the US and other places, um, trusted partners effectively. But all of this has Im impacted on price. And, and within our member states, what we're seeing is you know, some warnings from some member states were saying to their citizens, we might have some issues around supply of electricity during the winter months. So planning. And the whole approach of the, the commission is to plan to avoid that the worst should happen. So all our work before the summer and since around uh, uh, stocks of gas. So our storage is, is really over 90% now. That's good. So we have 
plenty of gas in store. We're also looking to uh, member states individually are doing things that perhaps with climate in mind they, they wouldn't do, but they're needing to do it around some coal plants that need to be uh, kept open, and nuclear in some member states as well. So there's been a readjustment, but not a complete moving away from, from our main agenda, which we can talk about as well around climate. So I think all depends on the next few months. But the man who really, I suppose, sadly, uh, might know what happens is the guy who's illegally invaded Ukraine. And I think that we have to realize that is, Ukrainian citizens um, and those who are fighting for their country are feeling the worst of all of this. We're getting secondary effects. We're being very clear with citizens, at least I am in my conversations, that yes, we have higher energy costs, higher food prices. We need to protect vulnerable parts of our society and our businesses, so critical uh, businesses, large and small, need support, and that's happening across the member states. Ask me to go into next year. I mean, those who know are saying uh, inflation should moderate. And I think we would expect that as well, but I, a lot depends on the trajectory of this uh, war. But I think that the, the line of sight is Russia has now cut itself off by its actions from the global financial system, from the commodity supply chain, and there's no going back. And I think that was a strong message from the president of the commissioner, Ursula von der Leyen, where she said, you know, sanctions are here to stay. There will be no appeasement because we will not get a result. We will only go backwards. So all of the hope I had in January is a bit more, I suppose, cautious now. Uh, one of my titles is financial stability. And I think we had financial stability during the COVID crisis, despite some concerns, but that was good. And I think at the moment, we, we keep check on everything, but we would say that to date, you know, financial stability is being maintained. We're also looking at how energy markets might impact on financial stability. So we're doing some measures, financial instruments around trying to take some of the stress out of futures and derivatives, but we're not doing it uh, with any risk. So we're very mindful that any action we take in, in terms of detail will not impact on financial stability, because that's core. We knew the, the last financial crisis is still a horror story for many people. So the, the core of our work in the Commission is to ensure uh, energy security, financial stability, and to keep on our programme around the transition, both digital and green. Uh, some think we'll be knocked off our course, but in fact, in my view, we will be accelerating our efforts towards renewables, energy efficiency, all of these things that were in train anyway, we have to do more, we have to do quicker, and we have to do it better. So can't answer exactly those timelines you've given me, but I think you know, we can manage uncertainty if we face into the different options that are there. And if we take action before there's a problem, rather than being reactive when a problem hits. I think we've been doing that. So let's, that, it's interesting what you say about sort of Putin's crystal ball, which, which you know, we can talk about in a minute. Um, I think, like, for, for me, I spend most of my time with companies and CEOs and, and people who work in the capital markets here, and the war has moved sort of from front of mind to back of mind. Um, and, uh, hit, you know, the war's influence over capital markets really only pertains to sort of capital markets going again, which is close, more closely tied to interest rates, say, than what's going on there. So it's, it's fascinating perspective that you have. Um, it's sort of impossible to talk about the next year without thinking about energy transition and how the war is going to play into that, but um, how governments are thinking about funding it. And um, so maybe you can talk a little bit, you know, that the, the sort of funding of the energy transition is working at odds with what uh, central bankers are trying to do to control inflation. So how do you ensure that the money being spent on the transition is not being wasted? Well, we can't waste it because we need a lot of it. I think that uh, I mentioned that we're still on our trajectory around the Green Deal, except we're having to accelerate. So the issues around investing um, in retrofit of uh, both businesses and homes and then renewables uh, we're saying to member states, get rid of all the bottlenecks that are there, whether it's per permits and planning, and just get the investment flowing. I mean, clearly, the, 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 I suppose the background music has changed. Interest rates and inflation are there, and supply chain problems as well, also hitting the renewable sector. But it, it's, it's not a reason to say that we will um, have missed um, investments, because if you look at the instruments we have, whether it's, we call it a taxonomy, but essentially it's a way of uh, pointing to both corporates and the financial sector, 
what is a sustainable investment. We have a corporate sustainability reporting directive, which will clarify for businesses what they need to report. And we have other regulations around this area. So all of the pieces of the, um, the jigsaw around how you motivate and drive private money towards sustainable investments are in place. And I don't know if this is a message that is um, fully understood, and it's good to be here uh, to discuss this, is that we believe we need to reach a place where uh, return on investment, so money, money, money matters, are on an equal footing with sustainability. So sustainability rises more, and they're equal. So an investor doesn't look just at, I mean, when I studied accounting in the, for the well, I was going to use my Irish, for though, for though, so a long time ago, uh, it was only about money, return on investment, P&L, balance sheets, all that. Now, even for, you know, for social reasons, um, for uh, certainly from a European point of view, companies want to be seen to do the right thing. Many of them are and they're showing it, but actually we're going to ask them to report it and it will be verified. So I think that we're on a trajectory or a, a path from which there is no turning back. We know that businesses are under pressure and they don't want more bureaucracy or whatever. But any company that wants a future has to be sustainable. And that applies to all in the supply chain. Um, so this, um, and you said the war is off the agenda, perhaps not as high on the agenda here, but the impacts of it are. So uh, there's no doubt that sometimes, and this is the horror, that people get accustomed to war. I think because Europe is closer to physically Ukraine, um, that's not happening. But of course, people then do sometimes turn away from what is big to what is personal to themselves. But I want to be very clear that our um, work on sustainable investments, on having Europe both uh, more sustainable on the climate and environmental issues, is there to stay. And all of the work both of Parliament and Member States is in that direction. There will be blips along the way. I think your question about how do you know, you know that the money will be well spent? Well, well for me, there's just a very big uh, one-liner here. We have found that because of our over-reliance on Russian fossil fuel, we're very vulnerable. We did not have the resilience that we thought we had. So there is no choice but to build resilience. Um, we talk about open strategic autonomy. Uh, we knew that during the COVID crisis, our pharmaceutical supply chains were less than resilient, and we've taken action in that area, rightly so. On energy, it's very clear uh, that you know, climate is obviously one of the reasons we're, we're moving towards more renewables, but actually just for having more secure energy, we need to do that anyway. And I think that's fully understood, even if the circumstances are difficult. What I don't want to see uh, is that the private investors will keep the cash in the pockets or somewhere and not invest in, in the future. And that's what we're saying. That's our work on deepening capital markets. We're saying that to, um, to our banking colleagues as well. When we came out of COVID, there were those who had worked through it, had lots of money, and there was lots on deposit, but wasn't being invested. So some of the work even for next year on retail investment strategies that we're working out, our digital finance area, is all toward this more sustainable future, regardless of the background that we now have. And lastly, maybe to say that, you know, at the beginning when you looked at COVID, it looked like an, it was a nightmare, and for many, a human tragedy, a disaster of enormous proportions for which we were not prepared. So despite all of our sophistication, we actually missed something enormous, which is the value of public health. And I think businesses got it then, even those who may not want to think about sustainability or whatever, realize that actually you can be stopped in your tracks by a virus that knows no borders. So public health is important. And I think that resonates now when we talk about companies doing the right thing around climate and the environment. So I mean, I'm interested to know what the feeling is here, and I'm gonna to talk to lots of people on my visit, both here in New York and in Washington, as to how they view what we're doing. Um, but I don't think any company wants to be seen to do bad by the environment, well, by, by social issues. Uh, but there is, I think, some tension around, does money come first? In my view, both are important. And I hope we can reach a point where, when I was being taught accounting and finance, that it wasn't just about that, that you had to look at businesses in the environment they're in, they're part of local communities, uh, their environmental footprint. And young people are asking these questions as well. So I, I don't think that will shift 
In fact, it may deepen because of the uncertainties which this war, this illegal invasion has created. I mean, it's interesting because the climate in the US is different than the EU when it comes to environmental factors. I mean, there's, uh, you talk about ROA, right? American CEOs are under pressure now to some investors to actually prove what they're doing creates returns and returns that are higher than transition. And it's difficult to make that argument in the sort of near term, even medium term. Um, and they don't have the same social pressure that uh, European companies have. Um, can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on nuclear power and on uh, natural gas in the context of how you're trying to solve for two problems at one time? Yeah, I mean, again, I'm interested to hear what the mood music is in the US on these topics. I've, I've read and heard quite a bit. I mean, I think I'm very clear about where we're going. Around transition, and this is the key, to some extent, um, a lot of the debate has focused on, let's use the word green, on being sustainable, rather than on how do we get there. So for me, the conversation, and we've, we're leading and, and, and encouraging our companies to think more transition, to use all of the instruments we have, including this listing of what's sustainable in, in our taxonomy, to use it as a management plan to get to where they want to be. Um, and then to the point of returns and the different outlooks here. I mean, sometimes short term, you might get a huge return, but you might cost society and the environment hugely, and you might have to suffer payback at some point. So I think it's a very narrow focus if you simply take the immediate without taking the context. Um, and I know Europe leads the way on this. We have this concept of double materiality. So not only the impact of all of these issues, climate and environment on the company, but what impact the company has outside. We know that the US are not going in that direction right now, but we're not going to resile from it because it is part of our um, thought process and part of our legislation. And, and because we were leading on sustainable finance, I think it's important that we keep that there. It's important for the companies. So there is this, I suppose, discussion about um, everybody wanting more money now. But you know, the, the issue of wanting more money now hasn't served us well in the past. Before the financial crisis, people were making lots of money and was, whoa, it was, you know, gung-ho, and then crash. And then the public purse was called on uh, to, to pull us out of that. Uh, and I think around climate and environmental issues, I mean, if you take a mining company, they might make a higher return by ignoring environmental issues like polluting water or the air. But the cost of, you know, recuperating that area is enormous. If the company doesn't pay it, then the public purse does. Mm. I think we need more discussion around those very simple concepts. Um, I, I think those who think today in a linear way, are, you know, think they see the future, but they don't, because you need to be much more circular in your thought process. Um, so again, the differences are interesting. Uh, but in our view, and again, good to hear what the US perspective is, uh, we believe that our companies, if they follow us in terms of sustainability, and indeed many of them want the guidance we're giving to them, they might push back and say this is too much, but actually what they're saying is thank you for the clarity that they can deliver. I think that's always the way with companies large and small. If they're given clarity on policy and instruments to deliver, they will do it. Uh, but we're not ignoring the global approach. I mean, Europe is part of a global community. Uh, we contribute. Um, we would like to think that people would look at what we're doing and maybe come in that direction. But we're also working at baseline taxonomies, if you like. So working with the international community so that we're not at a step we would like to think that there will eventually be this baseline around what is sustainable. We will add to that, as we've done, but there is a baseline in place. So we work with um, the global community, and that's another important point I want to make while I'm here, that Europe does not see itself standalone. Many of our companies are global operators, and many global companies operate in Europe, so we need an understanding of where we are, the work we're doing, but also that the, the world is also moving in that direction, maybe with different instruments. But the idea of us ignoring what happened this summer, where we had droughts and floods and incredible fires, um, is just untenable. And I think anyone in leadership roles cannot ignore what we're seeing. And even on the energy piece, I think what's very striking for me is that, okay, Russia is playing and uh, blackmailing on, on using fossil fuel as a lever. We're moving away from that to not allow them use that uh, in the future. 
But climate moved against us as well. So the output of hydropower in Europe was considerably reduced to a trickle because there was no water. So those countries, those member states with a lot of hydro, didn't have a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. It also impacted the nuclear industry as well. And of course, wind doesn't always blow. So, so in a way, we have been taught very hard lessons. Maybe we ignored some of them in the past. I don't think we can do that now because people are feeling those problems in their villages and towns and cities. Um, and it is a bit of a wake-up call, uh, particularly the, the wider now acknowledged fact that we were over-reliant on Russian fossil fuel. We have to put our hands up and say that was not a good, uh, if you like, end uh, and hasn't ended very well and we have to change trajectories. And energy, in my view, is the key for the future. How do we manage in this period of energy insecurity getting to where we need to be. Uh, and that goes back to work around uh, private money because the public purse will do some of it, but it cannot and will not do it all. So lastly, on, on gas and nuclear, um, we took a decision that in transition, clearly you cannot go from coal to renewables. Um, so we needed to use energy uh, sources like gas and nuclear in transition. That can be quite controversial to actually accept that you need to use um, fossil fuel, which gas clearly is. I think on nuclear, the mood is changing because I know that there's an understanding that without nuclear, Europe would be even in a much more difficult uh, situation. Uh, so we see a place in our taxonomy for these energy sources in transition towards a more sustainable future. And Do you see a future with no fossil fuels at all? I mean, isn't that the the horizon that we're going towards, um, whether we will absolutely do that, no, but we will move away from the worst offending and it's the time horizon. And the piece that we're not, uh, I suppose, factoring in is rather than looking at what we know today, look at research and innovation. Europe invests enormous amounts of money in research and innovation. Look at the hydrogen capacities. So I think a lot of those uh, research programs will probably be accelerated and results get out there and there will be more momentum in that area around renewables. Um, and I think individuals are looking, as companies are, about how they can be more efficient. We're actually reducing our, our, our energy um, usage because at commission level, we said, look, we need to be more efficient, use less. Uh, and I think in all our countries, we're going to see in the months where electricity use goes up, a determination to spread the load. Well, firstly, to avoid blackouts, but secondly, to make our, our, our supplies stretch longer. And they're tough conversations to have. I mean, I, I don't think we should ever say, well, will we get rid of everything, you know, in time. I think what we should do is do what we can now, do the steps that are necessary. Uh, we've had a, a horrible wake up call um, about how fossil fuel is bad anyway, but it's worse when you're of an unreliable supplier. And clearly we're trying to, you know, work with other, um, you know, those who have uh, LNG to, to shore our, our supplies up. So, Gas will always be a component, I think, for, for some time. Um, and also until we get really good at storage of uh, wind energy and others, we're going to have to have that. But again, it's the trajectory. Uh, and there's no going back from that. There's no one saying, look, gosh, we have to go back and burn coal all the time. Although some member states, and I've discussed it with ministers, have said, look, we have to do this. I don't like doing it. But the one thing that will cause us all problems is if we don't have a just transition, and if there is social, um, if, let me say the other way, if there is no social cohesion. So if you break social cohesion around energy, um, I think you will have political instability. So I think all of us are being very clear about what the challenges are. Member states are doing the same. We're bringing people with us on this journey. Um, and it is one of the things, for me, it's, it's fundamental. It includes my work on financial literacy. You have to bring people with you on this energy transition, not by telling them this is going to be easy and we will hold your hand and everything will be fine, but by saying, actually, this is a very difficult time, hugely uncertain. You're seeing it in the markets, it's everywhere. Those who perhaps think they know don't, and that we're trying to navigate in very uncertain times, but we're still navigating on our policy of green and digital, and sustainability is the core of it, despite these other deflections uh, and, and bumps that we're hitting in the road. So I think bringing people with us on the journey is hugely important. Mm. Um, okay, well, let's pause there for a minute to get any questions that might come from the... I'm going to get to Russia sanctions next, so nobody steal my thunder on that. But um, if, are there any questions from the audience just on transition, 
uh, policy, green power. No, okay, great, I'll go. Uh, so let's talk for a minute then about sanctions because of course power plays an important part of this. Um, another sort of prevailing kind of consensus thinking here in the United States, which again, I'm not endorsing or saying is the accurate one, um, is that as the winter goes on, there's going to be less support for the war um, because people are going to start to get cold. And um, you just put in your sort of eighth, I think, batch of mm -hmm. sanctions, and part of that includes an oil price cap uh, to match the one that we have here in the United States. What do you think about that? And, and sort of how do you deal with what is an upcoming winter time that then may pull some support for what the sanctions that you're trying to enact? Okay, to your first point about what if people turn away from the global to the local? Right. I think people always, you know, think global, but think local as well. Um, if you look at across Europe, there is very strong support for our support for Ukraine. We're neighbors. Uh, many of our member states neighbor, in that neighborhood uh, are the best proponents of why we should support Ukraine, because they understand Russia of the past and Russia of the present. Um, I think it's, it's still uh, possible for people to have that concern and to continue the support while all uh, the while articulating their own interests, which is to have heat and be warm. I mean, the first people I would worry about are the citizens of Ukraine who are still there in that country and what will happen in the next few uh, weeks and months. I mean, it doesn't look particularly good as I wake up this morning, but they are very strong and resilient. So the least we can be is be with them. Uh, on the point of it being either or, I disagree with that. I don't think it's a question of um, that we cannot, you know, assist in our own countries uh, and citizens who are vulnerable um, and, and by so doing turn our back on Ukraine. We do both. So we, we remain committed to our support on Ukraine, committed to our implementation of sanctions, including the latest package. And the reason we do that is um, this is how we show Russia uh, that what they're doing is themselves cutting Russia off from the rest of the world. We're cutting them out of our financial system and our trading loop. And that will impact on their capacity, uh, their economy and their war machine. Um, and I, I get questions and people say, but it didn't work the first time. And, and I say, look, sanctions don't work overnight. They work over time. They work particularly well when you do it with allies like Japan, the US, uh, Canada, etc., the UK. And it is that a joint effort that puts the pressure on Russia. So if you take uh, issues like technology, I mean, Russia is a, is a commodity exporter and a, new, and a technology importer. You've had a brain drain from Russia. Those who do not want to be part of it are getting out. Um, in terms of products uh, and components, they're not getting those now. So any upgrade of their airlines isn't possible. Uh, so in a sense, uh, and I've, I've said before, you cannot you know, disconnect from the global economy. And we're pulling the plug, if you like, and not be impacted. And there is strong support for our sanctions, despite the fact that there are consequences for Europe. And we have been very clear from the outset that our sanctions were targeted at Russia with the aim of hitting them hardest uh, and uh, effectively, but there would be consequences for Europe. So I think we've had that conversation. And lastly, to say that for individual countries, um, some already have had targeted measures for businesses and individuals. I think that will continue. Um, what we like to think, though, at the European level, our work around um, a coordinated approach, and we'll know more about that later in, the, in this month, on energy generally is the way to go. And again, it's a lesson from COVID as to how we reacted. Maybe faltered in the beginning, but in the end, we pulled together very strongly. And I think that's how this will deliver as well. So I don't see it an either or. Uh, I think we can do both, as long as we communicate effectively what we're doing. Um, and then when we come to the ACE package and, and price cap, there's a lot of discussion around these price caps, whether it's oil or gas. So we, we have a mechanism in this last package which will allow us work with the, with the G7. There's discussion around a gas cap. And I think what we're looking at are mechanisms and discussing with member states implications and consequences. So every time we propose something, we have to look at what are the consequences and, and think about unintended consequences as well. 
Um, one of my roles is sanctions implementation. So later this month, I'll be meeting some of the uh, top officials across our member states coming to Brussels to talk about implementation, uh, to try and get a full picture of the amount of assets that are now frozen. We have some figures, but really we know that there is much more. So we're getting better reports from our member states and helping them. I mean, a lot of uh, this is very, very deep and very new. So we have rolled out so many over such a short period of time that we have to help with detailed questions and answers for um, our member states so that they do the right thing. We're also looking at circumvention and evasion because as somebody said, and I won't quote who, you know, in war there are those who seek to profit. And we do not want to see circumvention uh, either internally in the European Union or through third countries. So we're working hard as well to try and see what is happening out there on trade flows, on financial flows, on the role of crypto. Uh, so we've, every time we've moved, we move then to close some, some gaps. And, and I mean, it, it is really, I suppose in 2022, to, to have to say that our, our world is more fractured, more broken than it was in January is, is tragic to say, but that is the case. Um, and that's why it's very, very important that we are strong around sanctions and strong in explaining why they're important. Uh, and why our support for Ukraine is important. Because those who believe that it could be otherwise, that we would turn a blind eye, I mean, I just think that would be unthinkable. Uh, and maybe an interesting, again, to get the US perspective, because you know the United States are very strong on sanctions uh, and on implementation. We're working very closely together, uh, strong on supporting Ukraine, because there are bigger issues uh, at play here. Uh, the idea that a very large independent country could be invaded and territories just taken uh, in 2022 is quite frightening. And if you travel, as I did, to um, the Baltic member states before the summer, I mean, there's where everyone should go because you hear and sense their understanding of if we are in any way weak in our support for Ukraine, uh, we are going to feel really, really severe impacts. And that's why we're not weak. I mean, I think the leadership shown by President Ursula von der Leyen of the Commission has been extremely strong, working with allies, working with Ukraine. Um, perhaps there was an expectation from the Russian side that this would be a matter of a few weeks and there would be capitulation. That hasn't happened. Uh, I think that's important. But equally, and you go back maybe to your first question about hopes and fears, I mean, I hope that the crystal ball wouldn't see this as being prolonged, but we have to be prepared for every eventuality and possibility. And that's why markets are definitely jittery, uh, and we can see that around the world. Um, but at some point, I think markets also factor in uncertainty. Um, and, and I would hope that the uncertainty which we saw during COVID, which are of a different origin, um, I, I would hope that at some point we would manage as well so that we reduce this instability um, because it, it really doesn't help us achieve those uh, targets that I've discussed around sustainability and investments that are really, really necessary, including in digitalization. So we'll get to crypto in a minute because I do want to dig in on that. But to, quickly, to those who say that the policy that's been put in place globally, various policies um, against Russia have driven up oil prices and actually enriched the country. They've since come off, but what is your answer to that? Well, I mean, it's, you don't have to be very bright to see that if somebody is p pulling out of, and we're pushing them out of our markets for good reason, because they're unreliable to say the least of it, there's a consequence on, on price of energy. Um, I think that the market has been so unnerved that some of the price spikes, they've come down and said the heat has come out of it. So it's hard to see where the market actually is. Um, that is one of the consequences of what Russia has done. Yes, we've had energy price increases. Many of our leaders, and I will repeat it, are saying we are never going to go back to the era of very cheap energy. Uh, and cheap fossil fuel, in a way, doesn't help us achieve our end game, which is not to have fossil fuel in our energy systems at all. So, so I think, yes, of course, this is all impacted on energy. Uh, but just, I mean, our actions are, are one thing, and I think we've taken the right course of action here. But Russia was playing games with energy. Russia was playing games with food when you saw what was uh, the grain stores be being trapped. And I see some concern about uh, whether that is actually being as effective as it needs to be. So we're acutely aware about energy insecurity and global food insecurity. And we all have to act to make sure that those who are 
you know, so vulnerable around the globe, and, and I've seen some uh, reports from many countries, including Somalia recently, um, they're so far removed from what's happening in Ukraine, but they, we do not want that their plight, which is very bad, is worsened by the hoarding of, of grains, uh, by you know, the, Russia not allowing uh, grain from Ukraine to flow, or indeed fertilizers. So I think there are big, big issues here which we're, we're addressing. Um, and we have never ever said, other than the unreliability of Russia, its decision to switch off and on and whatever, um, to tweak with energy in a very significant way, of course, impacts energy prices. Um, and that is just the way the world is today. So I don't think it's, it's um, a question of we could have managed it otherwise. I mean, the other thing, option, the option B, which I don't think would ever happen, is that we just continued as if there wasn't a war. And that would be unthinkable uh, mm. from our side. And the main uh, export from Russia is energy. Uh, and of course, they've benefited from high energy prices. But we're not going back to... Uh, at any time in the future to buying from Russia. So in a way, they're very short-termism. Um, but these are facts which we have communicated very effectively. Now, I think for me, the big question is, what does this do to business, to households, uh, to financial markets? What does it do to financial stability? So around the energy piece, if you look at some of the discussions we're having, there's some little, little there are tensions there around futures markets and derivatives. We're trying to ease those um, stresses, uh, including circuit breakers and other mechanisms. So when I discuss this with finance ministers around the member states, they do want us to act, but they're also saying just our first priority is also financial stability, so that we don't allow energy issues and tensions flow into the financial system and cause instability. And I think we have to all to be very conscious of that. So actually getting more information on what's happening in the energy space at the moment is really, really important. And we're doing a lot of work around that. Um, but price is what price is. Um, but equally, I think if, when we make announcements and take measures, it does impact the price in a good way in that it comes down. The issue of price um, caps is how you actually implement. And I think that's a work in progress for us. It's a discussion amongst member states um, and indeed in the European Parliament. Um, so. We're on a, we know where we need to be, uh, and we're having these detailed discussions about the how, the why, and the consequences of. Um, the other piece of our discussion is around electricity prices, which are linked to gas prices. So there's a big discussion here about how do we make the electricity, rather, how do we make the electricity market um, less, uh, if you like, uh, caught up in the gas price spikes uh, that happen. So that's a piece of work that my energy colleague is doing as well. So, I mean, we're, we're acutely aware of what's happening uh, in the energy markets, how it might impact the financial system. Um, and that's why, in fact, most of our main policies which were in place are as pertinent as ever they were, um, including around efficiency and renewables. Um, and, and removing bottlenecks in that process because there are many. So let's talk a minute about crypto um, because you brought it up earlier, but also because this is, this is sort of where money flow is moving mm. uh, and it's very hard to regulate. In the US, the response to crypto has been, in my view, in two places. One, the SEC going after people like Kim Kardashian because they can't figure out how to regulate the market. And you know, on the other side, you have law enforcement you know, going sort of directly to crypto exchanges and, and cryptocurrencies and asking for them to give transparency, which they can decide to do or not, on where the money flow is and trying to follow it. And that's not easy. And they haven't really, you know, they, they've had some fun stories, but they haven't had any, you know, huge stories, let's say, about who they've taken down. With regards to Russia, right, you can sort of see how this becomes a market where money can flow and people can get around the capital systems that are being put in place individually. And more broadly speaking, it's, it's nearly impossible. To, it seems from where I'm sitting, nearly impossible to regulate on a global level. And that's really where the regulation has to happen. So how do you think about that? You have policies put in place where you are, but really you're sort of beholden to policies elsewhere too and, and global coordination on those. Okay, I, I like your term, fun stories in crypto. There's some <laughs> horror stories in crypto. Horror. Uh, well, and, and I mean, we haven't discovered the... I guess what I'm saying is we've, we've seen stories of people 
taking money yeah. and they're amusing, but like there are horror stories. Are. We just haven't captured them yet. And that's a yeah. problem. But, but, but they're, they're there. Uh, I think a few points around crypto because the more I know, the less I understand, frankly. Um, crypto arose, in my view, from those who wanted not to be in the regulated space. So a parallel system mm -hmm. where you could have your own currency way of, of purchasing that wasn't impacted by bothersome people like me or, or people here in the US. The problem is the extent of it is such that we now realize that if we allow it to continue unbridled, and I think of the Wild West analogy here, that you could have financial instability problems. So there's a duty of care here that we don't allow that happen. How we do it, we have a piece of legislation, markets and crypto assets. We talked all the time during that process, and my colleague Paulina is here with us. We talked to our US counterparts all the time so that there was a full understanding of what we were doing and why we were doing it. Um, and we now have a legal framework in place, so around regulators, around uh, you know, details about what is it that you're actually offering and what are the um, protections there for investors. Every time I talk to people about this area of crypto, I think of young people. Um, I'm not sure the average age in the room, but it's looking youngish until I walked in maybe. But, but, but it is interesting. If you talk to people who've been in the financial system, who have a career in it, and those who are just dabbling in crypto, there's a very different mindset. Um, and maybe dabbling means gambling. Um, and this is where I think we're, we've crossed, if you like, uh, the, the path where we've now said to crypto operators, you're actually now part of the regulated space here. You're no longer operating as you would wish. And I think recent events have shown how timely it was with our proposal uh, that we were there. And again, I'm really interested to hear what's happening just today around uh, some recommendations for crypto. So I think we had to act because of the consequences um, that could have been for financial stability. Maybe not yet tomorrow, but, but if we had let, allowed things go for another few years, without um, some pullback and some transparency. Second point then is around, again, going back to the idea that crypto didn't want to be part of a, a regulated space. For those who want to evade sanctions, it could have been a really great area to, to get involved in, but we've closed up the net, closed the net on, on this. Um, so there's a bit more transparency around transactions. And then I think that the third piece for um, central banks and others is how do you, and, and policymakers generally, is how do you keep the, the good pieces, the innovation there, but manage the risks? Um, and there's always a concern amongst those who innovate that they get pulled back by regulation. Uh, and my view is, yeah, exactly, that's why we do it, so that you at least take a breath um, and allow the good pieces uh, of uh, the technology behind all of this to move forward, and we've done that with pilot projects uh, and other ways. So what our strong message in this area is around, yes, the innovation will come. We don't know where it will lead to, but we want to be aware of it. We want to understand what's actually happening there. And we want people who invest in crypto um, to actually know what they're doing, that what, can, what goes up actually can go down, because I think there are some who thought it was a never ending, um, you know, one direction only. There is a lot of discussion around, and I've made this point before um, with my US colleagues, we need global coordination on this because crypto doesn't have borders or boundaries. Um, so I would hope that the work we're doing, and we're very, as I said, working with others globally, will be fully understood and be part of a wider movement to bring crypto into the regulated space. We're not banning it. I think that's important. So we're not saying it's bad, it has to go. But we're, we're saying we need to know exactly what's happening there. And we need to make sure that there's, responsible, um, there's responsibility for those behind it, that if they're making claims, whether it's stable coins and others, that they can verify it and that our regulators will be able to check as well. Um, one of the things about law and legislation, and I was a long time in the European Parliament uh, and now in the Commission, is the rate of change, I think, in the financial system around technology is breathtaking. And it's how do we keep our rules up to date, you know, relevant, future proofed. And that's a lot of our you know, discussions before we make proposals is, is around that area of not stifling what might come because a lot of it could be very positive, 
but not allowing everything to just wash over because of the risks to those individuals. I mean, I do think um, if you look at influencers and where people are taking their advice, again, if you look to a younger audience, they may not be reading, and I won't name the papers, uh, but and what's a paper? Somebody said to me recently, <laughs> what's a newspaper? But they're getting it from influencers and social media. And I think we need to be mindful of that and have an eye, as some are, to who's, who's making these uh, claims, how much they're being paid, and whether those who are taking the advice fully understood what was going on. I mean, they, when it comes to trading, like payment for order flows or inducements, all of these things, again, it's about how wise are those who are actually investing. Uh, one of the, the things I keep saying to my team, and they work very well with me on this, is that those of us who had some financial education in the past are at an advantage to those who've had none. And in a fast-moving financial area, we need to make sure that we can talk about money. You don't have to understand the entire financial system in and out, but you have to be confident to ask the right questions. And I don't think we're there yet. And I think that feeds into disadvantage and vulnerability. And I think particularly in an era where things move fast. So we're working with member states and the OECD to try and get more, more talk about money and let people have more control and ownership so that they can make their own decisions about where their pension fund gets invested or how they save for an education policy uh, and that they will understand that there is no such thing as free. It's interesting that the uh, next pump and dump scheme on the crypto market comes from influencers influenced by Kim Kardashian. I suppose it's amusing. Um, I'm not sure how we're doing on time, uh, but maybe I'll uh, open it up again one more time for audience questions and... Um, oh, good. We have a couple here. Oh. <laughs> oh, maybe we might need, need, need a mic because it's being uh, sorry. Yeah, live stream. Um, Thanks, Commissioner. Thank you for this presentation and uh, fragmented uh, attention is what we are all learning extremely fast. I would like to shift to a slightly different. Uh, aspect, which is the macro situation of Europe. And I'm taking it from a financial stability standpoint. Uh, we are um, seeing, as you probably saw, uh, that the Federal Reserve has been in the last stress test singling out JP Morgan, Citibank, and Bank of America, which are not the smallest banks of the country. And they have increased their provisions. In Europe, we have two characteristics. There seems to be very little in terms of imposing discipline, whether it's by the regulatory authority, a DCB or the Commission. But more importantly, there is a huge exposure, traditionally in Europe, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> to sovereign debt of one own country. With the increase of interest rates, the fiscal policy of some countries, and I'm particularly singling out the ones that have more than $2 trillion of debt, so you know which ones I'm talking about, are going to be facing a huge fiscal deficit as a result of the increase of interest rates. So my question is, is the banking sector in Europe able to take a possible tsunami of problems in the sovereign debt side of the EU. Thank you very much. Particularly the EU, of course. It's a great question, which I'll be very brief, because I think part of your question is a comment um, on the macro situation in Europe. Um, and obviously, we have to be very mindful of all of that. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm very conscious. I'm not going to go into the detail, country-specific issues. Uh, but we've managed the situation thus far. I mean, your, your last question is very pointed uh, about a tsunami. I mean, I was very concerned out of COVID that there would be a tsunami of um, uh, bankruptcies. Uh, it didn't happen. In fact, quite interesting, the level of bankruptcies declined. Um, of course, we're mindful of what will happen across our member states should the worst happen. Uh, but that's not to say that it will. So there are tensions. There are particular difficulties in some member states. And I think I will go back to John's remark on confidence. 
And there is almost, um, you know, the or word gets used, so recession, which makes people feel very, very gloomy, which has exactly the impact of your question. I think we need to, you know, you know calm our nerves here. Um, and I'm quoting uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the president, you know, you need strong nerves in a crisis. And if you begin to see everything as a doomsday scenario, you won't get out of bed. But we have the levers and the policies to actually react. The ECB is independent, so I won't step on their territory. The discussions between member states can be quite, you know, tense at times, but there's a very strong determination that we hold together. And that for me is the key to all of these issues, whether it's sovereign debt or how we dealt with the pandemic, that despite all the differences, that Europe has found in its more difficult times a way of moving forward. At the moment, our banks are resilient. Uh, and that's because of the financial crisis. Um, there were times, and I was in the parliament before that hit, where you know, deregulation was the wow word. You know? And I think anyone who says deregulation now should, shouldn't actually say, because regulation, even if it's unpopular, works because there's public oversight and, and control of what can happen. So we have to keep a close eye on the financial system and the knock-on impacts then on interest rates for public debt. So I think later this year, if I'm not mistaken, in, in the coming weeks, there will be um, a communication on this from my colleagues in the college. Um, not addressing your exact question, but making sure that what you are predicting as a worst case scenario doesn't happen. Um, so again, I go back to the point that if you're prepared, you can deal with what comes. But if you only see the downside here, and, and if you look at what's happening in markets, and we've had a, just an earlier discussion with John and others, nobody's in a great mood. Everybody's a bit pessimistic, so we're holding on, hoping for a sign, uh, you know, to, to sort of calm the nerves a little bit. Uh, and I think that's the leadership that uh, the Commission has got to give, that even in times of great concern and angst, we have not been found wanting. There have been very tough challenges in my time since uh, my engagement uh, in 2004 in the European Union, not least during the financial crash. But surely we've learned our lessons. We are moving into an era where interest rates are, are moving upwards. Um, and there are other areas uh, around the globe where this is really, there, there's pressure in the system. So yeah, I think you're right to raise it because these issues are there. But I wouldn't always go with the scenario that it's, it's, it's really going to cause the worst case scenario. Because first of all, I think we have levers to avoid that. We, you know, we've, we've come close to very difficult points before, not just in the financial side, and we've pulled ourselves out of it. I mean, that's why we're here. Uh, let's take maybe two more questions and then um, I have the last one. Yeah. Thanks very much, Commissioner. And uh, I know you left your crystal ball at home, but you've covered a range of topics already. Um, you talked about the intended consequences of Russia's actions in the Ukraine in terms of the energy crisis, food crisis, and how that sort of fed into other issues like the cost of living and emerging from COVID. What are the unintended consequences that we don't hear about? Or what are the issues that the European Union, I guess, is firefighting that just don't make the headlines because member states, indigenous peoples are focused on those primary issues? What are the, the issues, I guess, that are sort of like below the radar but ever present because of these actions? That's a, a weird one. Um, because I think the ones we've talked about are big enough uh, to maybe mask other things, but the, but the ones around food and energy are, are, are crucial. I mean, I don't know if there's anything else that makes um, me, you know, gives me sleepless nights. I have to say that January, before the war, and I think we need to be mindful, there were, there were um, indications that commodities were moving up. Anyone who was following this, and I was following it closely, I live on a farm, I was watching what was happening and wondering gosh, is this a sign of things to come? And it was. It's just, I think, the impact has been accelerated. I mean, personally, I think global food insecurity is something that we all need to work very hard on. Um, you know, those who are privileged to eat three times a day or more have no idea of what it is to be hungry. I come from a, a member state where even though the land was rich uh, and there was food, there was famine. Uh, in the late 1800s, and, and indeed people came to the US because of that. Uh, so I think that the, the, the nexus between energy uh, and food insecurity is, is there. 
Uh, we're working hard uh, with countries around the world to avoid that it gets worse. But we have a lot of things to do. Maybe the things that don't hit the radar. You know, I think in public debate, you always get those who are for and those are against. So if I take around sustainability and environmental challenges, you either believe or you don't believe. And I try and say, well, OK, let's take that off the table and look at what we're doing. So isn't it a good idea that we use less energy? Isn't it a good idea that we look at soil quality so we grow food, we can grow more of it? Isn't it a good idea we reduce expensive inputs uh, and other um, chemicals so that we, again, on the food supply, have a sustainable chain? I think there's no focus on the good that's happening. So the bit that's under the radar, actually, is, is people are responding. Whether it's in Europe and elsewhere, uh, there is a lot of work going on and we need more around research, innovation. I'm a great believer that there are things we haven't discovered yet that will help us enormously and translating that research uh, and innovation into practical application. And I think, I know one of the observations I've made around food because I'm an agricultural economist is that there's been a, a row between conventional agriculture and organic. A false kind of narrative. You're either for one and against the other. Um, my view now is given the way uh, the restriction on fertilizers and indeed the cost and availability, you're going to see techniques used in systems used in conventional because they work. So, so, so I think that underneath all of this really high level concern that we've discussed here this morning, you know, at ground level, people are doing things in their own way to respond as they can. So we have to look after the big picture, but also be mindful that underneath that people are taking action, including reducing energy. We've seen that. I mean, you can see it uh, across Europe. Uh, so I don't know if that answers your question. And if you have anything that I should be aware of that I'm not, will you please <laughs> let me know because it will be helpful. I'll grab you over a coffee. Um, do we have time for one more here? Uh, Commissioner, you um, mentioned the fractured world that we're in currently. After the financial crisis, we had to restore trust, yeah. and I'm interested to get your thoughts on where policymakers now need to be focusing. We've touched on crypto, which by its nature is decentralized. Um, we sit in the middle of a highly respected, trusted, long-standing financial institution. Mm -hmm. We have worked hard to restore trust in our institutions after the financial crisis. We now have a wave of new situations that are creating a lot of uncertainty for us all. So MICA was a great step forward in creating clarity, transparency around these brave new technologies and markets. But where do you see the focus needed next? We need cooperation clearly at a global level yeah. for all capital markets, but particularly for these new ones. So could you give us some hints on what you think World Bank, IMF, all the policymakers should be thinking of next to restore and bolster trust? Okay, I think um, I wouldn't take trust from the top of the agenda. I think, you know, trust is restored, but it can be easily broken. Uh, and we saw that happen. And indeed, I think that's why we have crypto, because there wasn't trust in the regulated, so-called regulated system. So never take your eye off that ball. I think if you look at what has happened in our banking system, for example, or in the financial world during COVID, I mean, there's been dramatic changes. I mean, physical infrastructure is not important. Uh, I, I, for me, the big issue is uh, cyber resilience, um, which we didn't discuss, but I'm glad you've asked this question. Because if you look around what has happened with some incidents on pipelines, physical infrastructure, that's pretty scary. If you look at the um, cyber attacks on some member states' healthcare system, that's pretty alarming. We know the financial system gets hit all the time, and it's good we're pushing back. But we have this Digital Operational Resilience Act, DORA, to, to literally focus minds on where the vulnerabilities. Because every time I use a card or transfer whatever I do in the back of the car, I, I kind of have to trust that it's safe. But a, a big hit on the financial system would be a very, very big hit because it would impact everything. And I know when I got this portfolio, um, people said, oh, financial services, isn't that very limited and restrictive? And actually, no, money matters across all systems. So I would say to those, and I'm sure I don't have to, who are in the financial space, that upping your game on technology, on resilience, constantly, 24 seven, is vital. I think it was never as important as now because we know there are bad actors. 
Um, we know that they have done their worst and they can do more. So for me, that would feed into the whole issue of trust. So cyber security, day and night. And I'm sure it's a topic in this room also. But again, you know, we've worked well to have this in place. Parliament and member states understand the need for it. Um, and we've had great dialogue with the US. I think you're right when you talk about global cooperation, because a hit on a financial system in one part of the world can you know, be replicated right across and magnified. Um, so yeah, just, just watch that particular space. Thank you. Okay, I think we're out of time. So I am going to ask one last question and one sentence answer, if you can do it. Um, what keeps you up at night? I'm so hardworking during the day that I sleep well. <laughs> oh, God. Actually, what kind of kills the day for me sometimes is if I look at the news feed too early in the morning. <laughs> oh. No, I think for all of us, these are difficult times, frankly. I think that was one sentence, so I can, I can blab now. <laughs> these are very difficult times. Um, but I, I, I also recognize that some of us are in a position to act, to, to innovate, to think, how do we help ourselves get through these crises? Um, you know, sometimes when I hear the word crisis in the developed world and I look to what's happening in other places, I say, crisis, what crisis? We have a crisis in vulnerable communities in Europe and indeed I'm sure here in the United States. Um, and I think the issue of inequality um, is, is really something that we need to address because it causes, it, it's wrong anyway that people don't have what they need in, in terms of the basics, whether it's around food or education or heat. Um, and I think Europe is strong on that. So this just transition piece is really important. Maybe I'll finish uh, on one key point for me is knowledge is power. Um, the more I work in this area, the more I realize most people don't have enough knowledge or haven't the confidence to ask their advisors, what am I paying for? What am I paying you? What, will there, what, is, what do I get out of this? Uh, so I hope that when I finish up, and, and it's coming soon, um, toward the end of 2024, that I'll have said this often enough, that people will begin to listen and say, money matters, we need to talk about it, demystify it. And I would put that over to you guys in the room and gals. Thank you. Thank you. So what keeps you up at night? I said, I'm allowed to turn the tables. <laughs> Whether or not the things you are doing are going to work, that's what keeps me up at night. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I don't know how to turn these off here.